Less than a month until the pivotal primary elections in Michigan. There's a race for governor and the state legislature there in a state narrowly won by President Biden in 2020 and narrowly by former President Trump in 2016. But even before the ballots are cast, there have been winners and losers and drama as several contenders for the Republican nomination for governor were disqualified for failing to produce a proper number of valid signatures to get on the ballot. And of the candidates remaining, one of them was in court Thursday. Ryan Kelly of West Michigan is charged in the U.S. Capitol breach. He pleaded not guilty at his arraignment in a lower-level case, and his next court appearance is set for September 22nd. That's less than 50 days before the general election, if he's the nominee. For more on this, let's bring in Aaron Navarro and Rachel Louise Just. Aaron is a CBS News Political Unit associate producer who's been tracking this race closely. And Rachel is a political reporter from our West Michigan affiliate WWMT television. Rachel's in Lansing. Let's start with you. And let's focus first on last night's debate. Take a listen. You know, January 6th, yes, I was in Washington, D.C. on January 6th. Yes, the FBI did raid my house in front of my wife, in front of my children, uh, put on this big theater show for misdemeanor charges. We were there protesting the government because we don't like the results of the 2020 election, the process of how it happened. And we have that First Amendment right. And that's what 99% of the people were there for that day. Yes, the 2020 election, in the state of Michigan was fraudulent and it was stolen from President Trump. Yes, just like Mr. Kelly said, you know, um, they turned our elections here in the state of Michigan like New York and California overnight. Well, we have to question what happens in an election when the Secretary of State changes the rules right before the election. Yeah, there's no question that there was fraud. There's no question that 2,000 mules shows us how it was done. Uh, different candidates, but uniform election denialism. Rachel, what did you see in the room? What were your big takeaways? Yeah, well, Scott, we're now about a month out from this election, and we still do not have a clear front runner in this race. As you mentioned, that's because we've seen half of these candidates drop out because of fraudulent signatures that were gathered just to get on the ballot. Now, it's kind of a race for first here. Um, recent polling we've seen here in Michigan has shown that around 50% of voters are undecided on who they even want. So last night was really about just standing out to the other voters to making sure that they take that top spot to try and make sure that they get those votes um, as soon as possible. Um, really what I'm seeing from these voters is kind of jumping over to an extreme. As you saw there, a lot of election denialism. We had pretty much all those candidates at least putting skepticism towards the election in 2020. And as you saw there, Ryan Kelly not ashamed, not hiding from the fact that he was arrested and is being charged with four misdemeanor counts related to January 6th. He wouldn't be the first political candidate to try to wear his arrest as a badge of honor in a Republican primary. Aaron, the governor's seat is held by Democratic incumbent Gretchen Whitmer, who has seen her stature rise quite a bit on the national stage over the past couple of years. And she steered Michigan through COVID. She has dealt with threats against her and her family. How competitive is this race viewed in a general election? Very competitive. Scott, a pollster today who does work for Republicans and media outlets in Michigan told me their latest numbers show Whitmer up 2% against the generic Republican in November. And that's even after all the shuffling of candidates. And after one notable one, former Detroit police chief James Craig was taken off the ballot. You mentioned Whitmer's COVID response. That is one thing Republicans think will still be a resonant message against her in this November election. The lockdowns, the handling of nursing homes were both brought up in last night's debate. To them, you pair that with the political environment that's already tough for Democrats on the economy, inflation, Biden's low approval rating. Republicans have argued that creates a tough path for Whitmer. Michigan Democrats I've talked to are confident she can hold on, but they also know it'll be a close race. And her campaign has been pre preparing for that. She had raised $14.3 million in 2021 alone. So both sides are definitely expecting a tough race ahead for sure. So if the margin is so narrow, turnout's going to be critical in November for the incumbent. Rachel, what do we know about potential turnout you know, from absentee ballots to Election Day? And what can we expect this year? We're starting to get our very first peak of that these last couple of weeks. Just about two weeks ago, we saw the uh, option for uh, Michiganders to begin to file to, or excuse me, to apply to get an absentee ballot here in Michigan. And you don't need to be out of state or have any reason to get that absentee ballot. With that, we had about 875,000 people, more than that probably at this point, applying to get an absentee ballot. That is a huge, huge jump from the last midterm primary we saw in 2018. About 507,000 people had uh, asked 
lost for it at this point out from the election. So I think, Scott, it's just showing that people are kind of starting to shift towards that absentee ballot. Of course, that creates some of its own challenges, but I think it's starting to show that people are very engaged with this election, even if they're not totally sure where they're going to land on it. And in Michigan, though, it's hard to get a high profile legislative race because of term limits, right? Yeah, yeah, it is. I mean, if, I think high profile for here is very different than high profile nationally. And with the term limits that we have here, you know, that's actually something that we're going to see on the ballot come November. We're going to see an option to expand our term limits um, overall in one chamber while limiting them overall. So I think that I guess we also get to see how people really feel about term limits here come November as well. Aaron, let's put this in context. It's a close state, but does that mean it's a bellwether state? Is this a state that could forecast anything nationally or ahead of 2024? Absolutely. The governor's mansion is up this year, and the new legislative and congressional maps have maintained or created competitive seats across the state. Both parties are definitely watching Michigan this November. Trump. Uh, the former president has endorsed at least 18 candidates in the state, a bulk of them being state legislative candidates, particularly those that have given credence or backed his debunked claim of a stolen election in 2020. The race for secretary of state this year could have a huge impact on 2024 and how and what absentee ballot access looks like uh, for residents in the state. And even on the Democratic side, there is a real chance for Michigan to get into that early window of primary states to either replace Iowa or be added as a fifth state for Democratic voters choosing their nominee. During their pitch to the Democratic National Committee, Michigan Democrats argued that Michigan is one of the most important battlegrounds in the country and will remain so. The DNC will finalize that lineup, that lineup later this year, but that push certainly adds to Michigan's importance in 2024 as a competitive battleground swing state. Let me take advantage of Rachel being with us from Lansing. Rachel, what are the counties that are the epicenter of a Republican primary in Michigan? Should I assume it's the same counties we heard about in 2020, Macomb County, those suburban Detroit counties? Yeah, I think that's going to be an interesting place for us to be looking, especially as you pointed out, Macomb County. And, and Scott, I know you're familiar with the Detroit area, so that's always a really interesting county to look into. And interestingly enough, that is where Donald Trump held his last rally here. So I think he's probably aware of that as well, seeing if he can stoke some good graces along those voters there. Live in Ingham County, it's Rachel Justin in Washington, D.C., Aaron Navarro. We thank you both.